ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله بارك الله فيكم may allah ta'ala bless you all in this life and the next so we are going to talk about we are back on the topic today the topic of being patient with the harms of the people so aku bila tawfiq we begin by saying ya khwan allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded the believers to be patient he said ya ayyuhalladhina amanu asbiru wa sabiru o you who believe be patient and be steadfast surah ali imran verse number 200 And Allah Ta'ala has informed us that he loves those who are patient. He said, "Wallahu yuhibbul sabirin." And Allah loves those who are patient. Surah Ali Imran verse number 146. And he has informed us that he is with those who are patient. Allah Ta'ala said, "Wasbiru inna Allaha ma'a sabirin." And be patient. Indeed, Allah is with the patient. Surah Al-Anfal verse number 46. And he has informed us that the reward for those people who are patient is paradise. He said, "Wajazahum bima sabaru jannatan wa harira." And he rewarded them by, um, by way of their patience with paradise and garments of silk. So that in San verse number 12. So when you hear the command to be patient, and when you hear that Allah loves the patient, and when you hear that he is with those who are patient, and when you hear that the reward for the patient is paradise, then understand that patience is of three types. الصبر على طاعة الله to be patient upon the obedience of Allah because you cannot obey Allah Ta'ala if you're not patient. Allah Ta'ala said رب السماوات والأرض وما بينهما فاعبده واستبر لعبادته The Lord of the heavens and the earth and all that's in between them so worship him and be patient upon his worship. So the Maryam verse number 65 and the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said والمجاهد من من جاهد نفسه في طاعة الله. The mujahid is the one who makes jihad against his soul and the obedience of Allah. So what's the first type of patience? Patience upon the obedience of Allah. The second type of patience is a sabr and al ma'siyatil. To be patient and to stay away from disobeying Allah. And this is because the soul calls you to disobedience. And the devil beautifies it. And evil friends make it easy for you to do. So you have to have patience. Allah Ta'ala said, "Wa amma man khafa maqama rabbihi wa naha an-nafs 'an al-hawa fa inna al-jannata hiya al-ma'wa." And but those who fear the standing before their Lord and they prevent their soul from its desire, then indeed paradise shall be their abode. And the messenger alayhi salatu was salam he said, "Al-muhajir man hajara as-sayyi'at" He said that the muhajir is the one who boycotts, who boycotts, who migrates himself away from sin. So what's the second type of patience? Patience away from sin. The third type of patience is to be patient with the decree of Allah Ta'ala. So here comes a question. From these three types of patience, which is the most difficult? The third one? Second one, first one. Okay, that's all three. So, <laughs> all right. Sheikh Wathi Amin, he says that the most difficult one is to be patient upon the obedience of Allah. He said, and that is because it involves a mental suffering and a physical suffering, meaning that you're going to have to put forth mental effort and physical effort in order to obey Allah Ta'ala. Getting up for the Fajr prayer, it requires a physical effort and a mental effort. Sitting here seeking knowledge in the heat requires mental effort and physical effort. He says as for staying away from sin, it only requires a mental effort because you don't have to do anything, but you are not doing something. You are not disobeying Allah Ta'ala. Right? Naam. He said and for this reason, being patient upon the obedience of Allah Afdal it has a virtue over being patient and staying away from sin. Now we move on to the third type of patience and that is patience upon what? The decree of Allah. Now this also has two types. 
being patient with the painful decree of Allah and being patient with the joyful decree of Allah Ta'ala. Shaykh what they mean, he said, being patient with the joyful decree, meaning that when something befalls you that you like, you have to be patient upon the obedience of Allah so you don't lose that blessing. Okay? So you have to show gratitude. Now, gratitude has three components. As shukr has three components. The first component is that you acknowledge, and, and, and Yaquan, as we mentioned this, I, I want us to ask ourselves, are we grateful to Allah Azza wa Jal? Right? So the first component of gratitude is to acknowledge with your heart that this blessing is from Allah. The second is to thank Allah Ta'ala with your tongue for this blessing. And the third is to only use this favor in the obedience of Allah Azza wa Jal. So let's look at the example of, is anyone here grateful for eyesight? Is eyesight a blessing? It's a nitma, right? So if you're grateful for that, you have to first acknowledge that the only one who gives you the ability to see is Allah Azza wa Jal. He's the one that gave you that favor. The next you say, Alhamdulillah, I praise Allah for giving me the ability to see. That third one is a little difficult. That you only use your eyesight in a way that's pleasing to Allah Azza wa Jal. So you don't look at the haram. Say to the believer to lower their gaze. All right? So these are the three components of being grateful. And Sheikh what they mean, he said, for this, he said, and for this reason, the messenger of Allah, alayhi salam, he said, and I say you do wali do Adam, wala fakhr. He said, I am the best of the children of Adam, and I'm not bragging. Meaning, I'm saying I'm the best of the children of Adam because I have to praise Allah Ta'ala for making me the best, but I'm not bragging about it. Okay? So th that was patience upon the joyful decree of Allah Ta'ala. And we said that patience upon Allah's decree is of two parts, right? What's the second part? Patient upon the painful decree of Allah Ta'ala. Right? Now this has two parts. To be pa patient upon the painful decree. The first is to be patient with matters that do not involve the creation, such as sickness, disasters, and storms. And the second is to be patient with the harms of the people. Which of these two types of patience with the painful decree is more difficult? The second one, right? He said, it's easier to be patient with the decree that does not involve the creation because a person understands this was the decree of Allah, so he submits to it. Either he's patient out of necessity or by choice. The second type, as we mentioned, being patient with the harms of the people. When people violate you concerning your wealth, your honor, or your person. And this is more difficult. This is severely difficult because a person feels he has been violated and harmed. And no one likes to be defeated by anyone else. So therefore, they seek revenge. And he said, and no one can be patient upon this type except for the prophets and the truthful people. So now here comes a question. What does it mean to be patient during a hardship? Now, when we say a hardship, it can be anything from stopping your toe or wrecking your car or a death in the family. What does it mean to be patient? To be patient has how many parts to it? Three parts. Sheikh Fozan, we're going to miss something for Sheikh Fozan. Sheikh Fozan said to be patient has three parts to it. He says patient during a hardship it is to refrain the tongue from complaining. That's number one. Number two, to, to restrain the soul from panicking. And number three, restrain the hand from slapping the cheeks or tearing the garments. Here's an example of not being patient. Now, an example of that is if something bad happens, a person says, I didn't deserve that. This question was asked to Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz, may Allah Ta'ala have mercy upon him. They said some individuals, when they visit the sick people, they say to them, you don't deserve this. 
Or if they hear somebody is sick, they say, well, Lahi, this person didn't deserve that. So they ask, is this type of statement permissible? Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz, he said, this statement is not permissible because this is in opposition to Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah is the most knowledgeable concerning the situation of his slaves, and he has infinite perfect wisdom in what he decrees upon his slaves from the affairs of health, sickness, wealth, poverty, and other than that. So it's only prescribed to say, may Allah grant him relief, may Allah heal him, and similar statements. Okay, now we move on to something else. When you are faced with any type of hardship, big or small, there are three things that you should do, and you can get three separate rewards. And this is a statement from Sheikh Uthimeen. And keep in mind, we say hardship, whether you stomp your toe, whether you lose your keys, whether you lose your job, whether you lose your spouse. Three things you should do. Sheikh Uthimeen, he said, it's obligatory upon the person afflicted with distress and sadness to remain patient. That's number one. Seek the reward from Allah Ta'ala, that's number two, and anticipate relief. He said these are three matters. Number one, he said, be patient, meaning that you restrain, you refrain from complaining and panicking and slapping yourself. You're patient. But number two is that you seek the reward. You're patient because you seek the reward. What does that mean? Some people, and he took this from the hadith, مَنْ صَامَ رَمَضَانِ إِمَانًا وَاحْتِسَابًا غُفَرَ لَهُ مَا تُقَدْ مِنْ ذَنْبِ Whoever fasts the month of Ramadan, having faith and seeking the reward to be forgiven for their previous sins. Some people, for example, if a bigger person pushes you down, some people say, well, I'm patient. No, you're scared. You, you can't do anything. That's a difference in saying, no, I'm not going to do anything because I'm being patient for Allah's reward. You see the difference? Being patient because you can't do anything, that's the patience of an animal. But being patient with the intent, I want Allah's reward, that's seeking the reward. And number three is that you anticipate Allah's going to bring you relief. He's, so he said, so if they are patient, so once the sin, once the hardship befalls you, your sins are removed. Once you are patient, seeking his reward, you get the reward. And then if you anticipate Allah Ta'ala is going to bring you ease, he said they shall be rewarded for that too, because that is husnul dhan billah. Now you're having a good thought about Allah Ta'ala, and the person that has a good thought about Allah Ta'ala, this is a righteous action that the person shall be rewarded for. All right? Now let's move on to something else. One thing that's important to understand, ya akhwan wa akhawat, is that Allah Ta'ala testing a person with hardship is not a sign that he hates the person. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, indeed, the greater reward is with the greater test. And indeed, if Allah loves a people, he tests them. So whoever is pleased, for him is pleasure. And whoever is angry, then for him is anger. This has been collected by Al-Tarmadi. So this is this whole lecture series from the most important series, Akhwan, that we have had in years. Because in life, you are going to be tested. You're going to see your loved ones die. Your parents, your grandparents, your brothers, your sisters, your relatives, your friends, your spouse. Be patient and seek Allah's reward. Allah Ta'ala said, we will surely test you with something, not complete, with something from fear and hunger, and something from a decrease in your wealth and lives, and your provision. But give glad tidings to the patient. Those when they are afflicted with a calamity, they say, Indeed, from Allah we come, and to Him we shall return. Upon them is the salutations from their Lord and mercy. And indeed, they are those who are rightly guided. So the Baqarah 155 to 157. And the Messenger of Allah. Alayhi salatu salam said that Allah Ta'ala said that there is not a reward for my believing slave if I take the life of his beloved in this world 
and then they patiently seek the reward except paradise. In life, you will be tested with your health, your wealth, and your children. But the messenger, alayhi salam, said, ma yuzalu al-bala bil-mu'min wal-mu'mina, that the male and female believer will continue to be tried fi nafsihi wa walidihi wa ma'alihi hatta yalqallah wa ma'alihi khati'a. That the test will continue to befall the male believer and the female believer in their personal self, in their children and their wealth until they meet Allah and they don't have any sins upon them. You may get married and not be able to have children. That's a test. Be patient and seek the reward. Allah Ta'ala says, وَيَجْعَلُوا مَنْ يَشَاءَ أَقِيمًا And Allah makes whomever He wants to barren, unable to have children. إِنَّهُ عَلِيمٌ قَدِيرٌ Indeed, He is all-knowledgeable, all-powerful. There's a chance you may get pregnant, but you may have a miscarriage. Be patient and seek Allah's reward. The Messenger of Allah, alayhi, والسلام, he said, I swear by the one that has my soul in his hand. Indeed, the miscarried fetus will drag his mother into paradise by its um, umbilical cord if she patiently seeks the reward. This hadith has been collected by Ahmed. This hadith is Hassan. Some kids, they die from sudden infant death syndrome. Be patient and seek the reward. If your child dies before puberty, remain firm upon Islam so you can join them in paradise, inshallah. Imam Ahmed, he said, the scholars do not differ that the Muslim children that die before puberty are in paradise. So be patient so you can be with them. You may have a heartbreak, sisters. You may be dreaming about marrying a particular brother. And then another sister marries him before you do. Be patient and seek Allah's reward. You think he was good for you, but Allah knows if he was or not. Perhaps you hate something while that thing is better for you. And perhaps you love something while that thing is more evil for you. And Allah knows and you do not know. Surah Baqarah 2.16 the great Sahaba, Ibn Mas'ud, anhu, he said, Indeed, the slave will intend to do an affair from business or job, and that thing will become easy for them. And Allah will look at that person and say to the angels, Turn that thing away from him, because if I make that easy for them, I'm going to enter them into the hellfire. And so Allah will turn that thing away from them. And that person will become sad. And they'll say, so-and-so outsmarted me. They beat me to it. But it is nothing other than Allah Ta'ala's favor upon that person. Your husband may take a second wife. Be patient and seek Allah's reward. Your husband may divorce you. Be patient and seek Allah's reward. Shaykh Abdul Aziz ibn Baz, Allah Ta'ala, was asked, if a woman is divorced, is she rewarded for her patience? He said, indeed, it is a calamity. If a woman is married to a righteous man and he divorces her, this is a calamity. He says, but she asked her Lord to replace him. As Allah Ta'ala says, And if they separate, Allah will enrich each of them from his bounty. So the Nisa, verse number 130, he said, but as for her being divorced by a wicked man or a man who harms her, for he is ni'mah min Allah. And that's a favor from Allah. It's not a musibah. It's not a calamity. Rather, it's a blessing. And understand, Yaquan, be patient. Patience is at the first sign of the calamity. What did the Prophet Islam say? إِنَّمَا صَبْرُ عِنَّا صَدْمَةً تِلْعُولَةً Indeed, the patience is at the first sign of the calamity, meaning that the patience that you're going to get rewarded for is when the calamity first hits. And how another way that you can help to be patient is to understand that you're going to be tested. A man from the Salaf, this was back before they had telephones and emails and texts and TikToks. It was said to a man, they went to him and they said, be patient. Your brother has died. 
And he said, I know I was already informed. He said, how were you informed and nobody came to you before we did? He said, no, Allah informed me that he was going to die when he said, Kullu nafsin mawt. Every soul will be a taster of death. So prepare yourself for that test. Ibn Al-Qayyim, may Allah ta'ala mercy upon him, he said, Know that the hardship is a beneficial medicine given to the person from the one who has full knowledge of what will benefit that person and is most merciful towards them. So be patient and swallow your dose of medicine. Don't vomit the medicine with anger and complaints and lose the benefit. Allah did not send this hardship to destroy you nor to break you. He sent it to cultivate you and elevate you. The shaitan, ya khwan, ya akhawat, he will tell you that your pain, your hardship is because you're Muslim. You're going through all this hardship because you're a Muslim. And he'll make you forget that you know that there's a non-Muslim actor that just died of cancer. There's a non-Muslim singer that just had a drug overdose. There's a non-Muslim comedian who just lost his wife. Non-Muslim basketball player died in a helicopter accident. Right? Rich and famous go through the same hardships everybody else goes through. But what's the difference? عَجَبًا لِأَمْلِ الْمُؤْمِنِ إِنَّ أَمْرُهُ كُلَّهُ خَيْرٌ وَلَيْسَ ذَلِكَ لِأَحَدٍ إِلَّا لِلْمُؤْمِنِ Amazing is the affair of the believer. His affair is good, all of it. And that is not for anyone except for the believer. إذا أصابته سر شكر فكان خير له وإن أصابته ضر صبر فكان خير له. If he is if he receives good, he is grateful and that's better for him. And if he gets hardship, he's patient and that's better for him. Imam Ibn Qayyim said something amazing to make us be patient. Inshallah Taala, he said that if Allah removed the veil. For us, so we could see how he manages our affairs and the other many tragic possibilities that didn't happen, that did not happen, and what he saves us from daily, and how he is more merciful to us than our mothers, the hearts would melt in thankfulness and gratitude for Allah's choices and mercy. But keep in mind a very important point when we go through these hardships, it's okay to grieve and it's okay to be sad. Being sad is natural. Allah Ta'ala informed us about what the people of paradise will say. And they will say, all praise belong to Allah, the one who removed from us sadness. Sadness is okay. The messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when his son Ibrahim died, he was sad and he cried. And he said, Inna al-ayn tathma' wal-qalb yahzan wa la nakul illa ma yurda rabbuna. He said, indeed, the eyes shed tears and the heart is sad, but we don't say except that which our Lord is pleased with. And indeed, we, because of your passing, O Ibrahim, are surely sad. Some people don't make a distinction between being sad and mourning. So if a person thinks about their dead, their deceased mother that died years ago and they begin to cry, somebody will say, why are you crying about your mother? She died 10 years ago. Why are you crying about that? And they may quote the hadith. It's not permissible for a woman who believes in Allah in the last day to mourn for anyone who dies for more than three days except for her husband. And she should mourn him for four months and 10 days. But they misuse the hadith. It doesn't mean that. Sheikh Fozan, he says, Crying when remembering your deceased parents is a sign of mercy is not blameworthy. Mourning and grieving are not the same. Mourning deals with the physical things that a person does. It means the woman stays in a home. She doesn't put on perfume. She doesn't put on henna or jewelry. She doesn't put um, kuhl in her eyes. And this has a time period. If her husband dies, she mourns for four months and ten days. If anyone else dies, she mourns for three days. This is connected to what she does physically. There is no time limit for being sad. So don't tell people they can't be sad and make people think Islam is so rigid you can't be sad if your mother died. 
This is not true. Can you be sad if your non-Muslim mother dies? You can be sad about that? The Prophet, his mother died when he was how old? Six years old. He visited her grave during the conquest of Mecca. They said the Prophet, alayhi salam, he visited the grave of his mother, Fabeka, Fabeka, and Hola. And he cried and he made everyone around him cry. And he said, I sought permission from my Lord to seek forgiveness for her. And he did not give me permission. And I sought permission to visit her grave and he gave me permission. They said, We never saw him crying more than he cried that day. It's okay to be sad, it's okay to grieve. But we don't say anything that displeasing to our Lord, and we accept his decree. Uh, so now we can turn to the book, page 33. Patience with the harms of the people. This is the seventh thing that will assist the individual to be patient when he or she is wronged with regard to their honor, their wealth, or their person. And again, this is the most difficult form of being patient with Allah's painful decree because the person feels he has been harmed by someone else and no one likes to be defeated. So they're going to seek revenge. And Yahuan, you really don't know how difficult this is until it happens. Until someone, until a business deal goes wrong and someone takes your money, then you realize this is more difficult than it seems when I was in class. I mean, Allah make it easy for us all. So the Sheikh, he says, seventh, the seventh thing is preserving one's beneficial interests. He said that he knows when he occupies himself with revenge and wanting to face up to the, wrong, um, to the one wronging him, his time will be wasted, his heart will become scattered, and his beneficial interests will be lost that cannot be encompassed. Perhaps this is greater than the initial calamity that aff afflicted him from their direction. But when he pardons them and overlooks their harm, his heart and his body will become free to pursue his beneficial interests, which are more important for him than taking revenge. Here we're going to read to you an explanation from our Sheikh, Sheikh Muhammad Ghalib, for this part. The Sheikh, he said, Allah Ta'ala created man to worship him. We have not created jinn or mankind except to worship me. And he has placed everything at his disposal to assist him in worship. Thus, when the person busies himself with taking revenge against those who wrong them, this will cause him to miss out on his own beneficial interests. And this will scatter his heart and distract him from his obligations. He said, so it is from the fiqh, the understanding of an individual is for them to know what is most important for them and what, is, and what is most important for them to do from the worship of Allah and taking care of themselves and taking care of their family and their children and their community and their job. But if they busy themselves with revenge, his mind will be distracted. How can I get my revenge? How can I get some get back? And no doubt he will waste his life. And your life is actually your opportunity to do good deeds. So if you wasted seeking revenge, then how much worship will you miss out on? How many good deeds will you miss out on? You will miss out on pondering over the Quran because you're pondering revenge. He said, and no doubt this will waste your life. Nine. Another end quote. Another thing, Yaquan, that always comes up, I'm going to ask you another question. Whenever two Muslims, may Allah forgive us and make us better, have a big argument, what's something that someone says when they can't come to a solution? What do they say? They say that, but that's not how they say it. They say it, you're right, but they say it in a different way. They say, I'm going to see you on that bridge. Listen, I'm going to see you on that bridge, right? And that's actually a misunderstanding, right? You have al sirat and al kantara al sirat because when you say you're going to see somebody on that bridge, then you are saying, yes, I'm definitely going to die a Muslim, and I'm going to cross the sirat, and I'll be waiting for you on the other side right before I enter paradise. 
I'll be waiting for you. How do you know you're going to die Muslim? How do you know you're going to cross the bridge? How do you know that? Right? So that, as, so Sheikh Othimin, he says that those disputes, when people take other people's deeds, that's going to happen before you get to the Sirat. That's going to happen before that. And everyone who crosses the Sirat, the bridge over Hellfire, they're not going to the Hellfire. They've been saved. That other bridge, the Kuntara, that other bridge after that, that's Allah is going to clean people's heart from any rancor before they enter paradise. But they ask the great scholar, um, the Mufti, Sheikh Abdul Aziz Ali Sheikh, may Allah Ta'ala preserve him, is it better to pardon a person in this life or to wait and get your right on the day of judgment? He said, Allah Ta'ala said, Wa liman sabara wa ghafara inna dhalika liman azm al lamin azm al umur. For the one who is patient and forgives, indeed, that is from the strong affairs. He said, so it's better to pardon that person in this life. He said, and it comes in hadith, there's no one who is oppressed and forgives his oppressor, except that Allah will increase them in might and strength. He said, thus, if they forgive them in this life, Allah will elevate you in degrees and grant you tawfiq. But if you don't forgive them, then you have to go to the dispute of the day of judgment and you may be compensated with something insignificant and small. But to pardon them in this life when you have the ability to do otherwise, this is more beneficial than for you. This is more beneficial for you when you meet your Lord on the day of judgment. End quote. Page 34. The eighth thing that will help you be patient is knowing the true status of one's soul. He said, as it relates to seeking revenge, and taking your right from the wrongdoer and aiding his soul in seeking revenge for it, then the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he never sought revenge for himself, ever. So when this is the best of the creation of Allah, and the noblest of them to Allah, who did not seek revenge for himself, despite the fact that the harm that came to him was harm received for the sake of Allah, and it relates to the rights of the religion, and his soul is the noblest soul, and the purest, most righteous of them, and the furthest of them from blame, from every blameworthy trait, and the most deserving of them from every beautiful quality. But despite this, he did not seek revenge for his soul. Then how can one of us seek revenge for his own soul? While you are more knowledgeable of the evil of your faults and, and sins that you possess, rather the man who knows himself, will not consider his soul worth seeking revenge for, as it holds no status with him, which necessitates him to seek victory for his sake against the wrongdoer. We're going to read to you the explanation of Sheikh Muhammad Ghalib again. He said, the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, never sought revenge for himself, although he was harmed due to his religion, not because of personal or financial reasons. It was always the religion that he was harmed. He said, so if you are a follower of the Prophet, then follow him in this. You indeed have in the Messenger of Allah an excellent example. So if the best of mankind with the purest heart can forgive and pardon, then knowing your sins and shortcomings, it is more befitting for you to pardon others, especially those who have rights over you, such as your parents, your children, your spouse, and your siblings. To seek revenge against those close to you is even more egregious. End quote. Now, here's something also that's, as we come to the end of this, something also that's very important. Do we pardon everybody? Does everybody get a pardon? No. Sheikh Othimim, may Allah ta'ala mercy upon him, because you, we see sometimes a person will murder somebody's whole family, and the, the people that survive, they go to court and hug the person, right? And people say, mashallah, that's great. Not necessarily. Shaykh what they mean, he, he mentioned the verse, فَمَنْ عَفَى وَأَصْلَحَى فَأَجْرُهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ And whoever pardons and rectifies, then his reward is upon Allah. He said, so if someone harms you and you pardon them and your pardoning of them is going to bring about rectification, then this is better. But if you pardon them and it won't bring about rectification, then it's not better to pardon them. He said, meaning, if an individual who is known for evil and known for transgressing people and known for harming people, and he 
and you pardon him is going to increase in him harming more people. He said, in this case, it's better not to pardon him, but get your right from him so you don't embolden him to keep on harming everybody else. He said, but if someone who's known to do good and they make a mistake and harm you, then it's better to pardon that person because now you're going to get the pardon and the rectification. Now we're going to end with something important, Ya Kwan, inshallah ta'ala. The danger of not being patient with the harms of the people and Allah Ta'ala's decree. Allah Ta'ala said, There are for mankind those who worship Allah Ta'ala as if upon the very edge. If good befalls him, he's at ease with that. But if evil befalls them, if a fitna befalls him, they turn back on their heels or, or turn back on their face. They lose in this life and the next life. Indeed, this is the greatest loss. So if a person has a hardship and they're not patient, why do they lose in this life and the next life? Because when you're not patient, that hardship doesn't go away. Right? A person gets fired from a job. They get upset. They begin to cuss and, and get upset. Does the boss hire them back? Still don't have your job. You stomp your toe. If you say, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, or you begin to curse, it's going to hurt for a minute and 30 seconds, whatever you do. Right? But those people, Imam Sa'adi, he said, if a person apostates after a hardship, he doesn't get the intended goal by becoming an apostate. He still has that hardship, so he lost in this life, but now he lost the religion, so he lost in, in the hereafter. And Aquan understand also that that hardship that befalls you, it already happened, and it's not possible to remove it. So therefore, what is the benefit in becoming depressed and lashing out and inclining towards the devil because of what happened to you? Because it can't, be, it can't unhappen. So here's something, Yaquan, that I want to mention to you about the harms of this, right? There's something called emotional atheism. The emotional atheist is driven by negative experiences such as death, divorce, sickness, and the inability to understand the divine decree, right? Shaykh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, he said that hardships and tests are like cold weather and hot weather. You know it's going to get cold and you know it's going to get hot, so why are you getting angry when it happens? Not being patient with the harms of the community can make a person stop coming to the masjid. Sometimes you see someone, they'll stop coming to the masjid and they'll blame the community and they don't understand that it was actually your sins that made you stop coming to the masjid. Imam Ibn Qayyim, may Allah ta'ala mention upon him, he said, uh, he spoke about the, the, um, the, the, um, the washa. He said that a person will have, he will be alienated between himself and the people. He said, especially the people of good he said he will find that he is alienated and he will become distant from sitting with them and therefore he will be prevented from benefiting from them and that will make him closer to the party of shaitan. He said a person will commit sins and become alienated from his wife, alienated from his children, alienated from his relative. He said you can even become alienated from your own soul. So I want to give you a quick example. You know something that will help us be patient with the harms of the people? Reading the biography of the Salaf, right? I'm going to give you a story of something that happened with somebody in recent time and the Salaf, and look at how they both dealt with it completely differently. It was a man that studied with us in the Madrashid Mukbil. Back in 1997, this guy was from Denmark. He was sitting with us, me and Sheikh Hassan and Sheikh uh, uh, Malik, Abu Hassan Malik, in Yemen, Damaj. But he eventually left Islam. He became an enemy of Islam. He became a spy against Islam. And now he worships Odin. You know Odin is, right? That's Thor's father. He worships Odin. He worships Odin. 
So why did he leave Islam? He said his grandma, this is somebody I know personally, right? This is, uh, I'm the, yeah. He said his grandmother died, and he could not accept the fact that his grandmother was going to the hellfire. So he left Islam. That's it. His grandmother died, he couldn't accept the fact that she was going to hellfire, and therefore he decided to join her. He left Islam. Right? Now, now let's look at the Salaf. There's a woman named Durra, and I want you guys to tell me who her family is. This woman named Durra, she was from the Companions, may Allah be pleased with her. This woman was informed that her mother and father were going to the hellfire, but they were both alive. And she was informed by a very reliable source, the most reliable source in the universe. Tabbat yada Abi Lahab wa tabba. Durra bint Abi Lahab, right? Her father was Abu Lahab, her mother was Um Jamil, right? When Durra, the daughter of Abu Lahab, migrated to Al-Madinah, some people said to her, you are the daughter of the fire or the firewood of hell. They said to her, you are the daughter of the firewood of hell. You imagine that? Now, when the Prophet heard this, and what relation was she to him? She was his cousin. He said, what's the matter with some people that they offend my lineage and my kinfolk? Surely whoever offends my lineage and my kinfolk has offended me, and whoever offends me has offended Allah. But that woman, that great, noble woman, may Allah tell please her, she was firm. She didn't let that, what the people said, make her leave Islam or, or make her upset. She was firm. She was patient with that, right? Another example. And this will be the last example, and we'll end with this. There's a man, another man that I know personally. And he was living in a Muslim country, and some difficulty befell him, and the Muslims didn't help him. This man had been Salafi his whole life. He left Islam because of this, because the Muslims didn't help him. Don't you understand that if you travel to a Muslim country, you're going to find some racism there. You're going to find people that are racist. You're going to find people that are mean. You're going to find people that are going to steal from you. What does it have to do with your Lord? Nothing. What does it have to do with your religion? Nothing. That's that person, right? Now, Ka'ab ibn Malik, may Allah ta'ala please him, he stayed back from the battle of Tabuk. And thus, by the command of Allah ta'ala, the Muslims boycotted him. And the Christians tried to persuade him to leave Islam. He said, while I was walking in the market of Medina, I saw a Christian farmer from Shem who came to sell his grains in Medina. He was saying, who will lead me to Ka'ab ibn Malik? And the people began to point me out. And he came to me and handed me a letter from the king of Ghassan. And the letter read, to proceed, I have been informed that your friend, meaning who? The prophet, Islam, has treated you harshly. Allah does not allow you to live in a place where you feel inferior and your right is lost. So join us and we will console you. See how I try to use Islam. Allah don't allow that to happen to you. Kam, he said, when I read the letter, I said to myself, this is also a test. So I took the letter to the oven and made fire with it. Now I'm going to tell you something that happened to me. When I was in Yemen... And this is how these stories can become practical. When something happens to you, you think back, okay, this is how Kaab responded, so let me try to respond similar. He's much greater than me, but I'm trying to emulate him. When I was in Yemen, there was a friend of mine, Idris Abdullah. May Allah Ta'ala preserve him. He's a brother of my close friend, Abu Inaya. May Allah preserve him also. He was studying with us, the brother Idris, in the match. So it was Hajj season, so he wanted to make Hajj. His mother was going to meet him on Hajj. So he went um, to get his Hajj paperwork, and they locked him up. And he had a visa. So I'm trying to be the good friend. I said, okay, well, I'm sure his mother's worried. I'm going to go get his mother's phone number from him so I can call his mother. This, this, this was before we had cell phones, Yaquan. I said, I'm going to get his mother's phone number. I'm going to visit him where? Inside the jail. 
get his mother's phone number, call his mother and let her know he, he's not coming. So I went to the jail and I said, look, I want to visit the brother Idris so I can get his mother. They said, OK, oh, you, you like to see him? OK. He's right there in that jail. So they showed me where he was at. They locked me up. They locked me up. And it was the, the, the high season. So, you know, okay, you'll get out, Bukhara. Bukhara, um, uh, Shabana, means what? <laughs> it means Allah knows best. Right? So, I was inside of the jail just waiting. And I had a visa too. And after the Hajj, you know, we spent the Eid. And of course, when you're in, in prison or jail, there's, in the Muslim country, you're not doing the Eid prayer there. Right. So we spent the Eid there and, you know, there's no one phone call. We're just there. We're just there. And after the Eid, the warden came back in town. And so, and so they said, OK, the warden wants to see you. And, and of course, the jail is, you know, a little bit, you know, it's kind of raggedy, you know. So they blindfold me. They walk me up the stairs and they sit me in front of the warden. He's yelling at me in Arabic. He's, you know, really badgering me and everything. And, and then all of a sudden he gets real calm and he says, OK, Take out the blindfold, and I take it off. And he said, do you know why you are being deported? I said, no. And I was real respectful. He's my elder. No, I'm more. He said, because the American government says if we catch any student from Sheikh Mukbil, send them home. Well, why he told me that? He said, the American government said if we catch any student from Sheikh Mukbil, send them home. And so they sent us home. And I had that one thobe on, and I was wearing a house thobe. And this is no offense. I'm sorry somebody's got a house stove on here, but, you know, the house stove, that's just the stove that you wear, you know, the sleeve of the stove. It's a house stove. And I had that one stove for the whole time I was in the jail, you know. And so they, they sent us back. And so I'm from North Carolina. Idris is from Jersey. And they gave us a ticket to JFK. And so I'm talking to the counselor from America. And I said, okay, well, I'm from North Carolina. The ticket says JFK. They said, I know where it says. Get North Carolina the best way he can. But Allah Ta'ala brought out some good from that. But there's a shahid to this, right? So when the preacher that from the church that I knew my whole life, when he heard about what happened, he said to my mother, he said, don't worry about that. He said, when he sees how the Muslims treated him, he'll be back in church on Sunday. <laughs> so they're always waiting, always waiting. By Allah's mercy, I wasn't in church on Sunday. Alhamdulillah, <laughs> I was patient with it. You know, but the Shahid Yaquan is that they're, they're always waiting, but just thinking about what happened to people better than me. Whenever something happens to me, I remind myself something better happened to somebody better than me. Whenever somebody says something negative about me, I say that somebody says something worse about somebody better than me. I don't say why not me, I say, I don't say why me, I say why not me. Who am I not to be tried? If, if people better than me have been tried with worse than what I'm tried with. So that's just my story, Yaquan, personal story. And inshallah, I'll mention more benefits about my prison time. And actually, I went back to Yemen after that, and they kicked me out again. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I'll tell that story later on, inshallah. I'm not going to bore y'all with that story, but inshallah, I'll tell you later on. Now, so uh, before we leave, brothers, a brother had a question. Um, it was um, a very interesting question. I was kind of surprised by the question, but may Allah Ta'ala bless the questioner. You know, last night it was a talk about the what of the Muhammad community. So a brother or somebody asked, a sister, whoever it was, may Allah bless them, they said, does that community still exist? Absolutely. They still exist. They, um, this past May, they put out a book about the relationship between what of the Muhammad and this woman from the Catholic Church. And alhamdulillah, this woman's inside the book. And you read about her. Just this month of June, the month of June, last month, they, they put out a book of what of the Muhammad's tafsir. And before that, they had a book about a tafsir before that. So they are not only exist, they're very active. And like I said, there's a YouTube channel that's in the back of the book, we put the videos that coincide with the book, and I've been getting some feedback, so I know they exist because they contacted me. You know, and to the point that uh, Sheikh Mustafa um, George, my Allah, I observe him, he said that um, he had gave the book to somebody, and the person said, okay, I'm going to go 
I'm, I'm going to read this book and I'm going to respond to him. Okay, alhamdulillah. So yes, they exist and they are very active. So alhamdulillah, may Allah Ta'ala guide us and guide them. Uh, also, the Nation of Islam exists and there's a book about them also. And there's a book about the Hebrew Israelites. And there's a book about the Jehovah Witnesses. And there's a book about the Ahmadiyya. All these different groups. So alhamdulillah, may Allah accept it. Alhamdulillah. And there's a book, um, there's a book um, in, that, there's about the Shiite, and, and there's a book about the Sufi. Also, alhamdulillah, about all these different groups. And of course, the Khawarij and whatnot. Now, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Muhammad.